Right, as my biology and chemistry videos seem quite popular, I'm now making a how you get full marks in your physics exam. So questions like this, a radiator also transfers thermal energy by convection. Explain how convection heats a room. You may draw a diagram to help you answer. Anyone who's been following me for a while knows that I will avoid drawing diagrams at any cost. So luckily we're not forced to do this and you just need to provide a per very perfect answer as to how convection currents work. So let's first of all state that air is heated and air particles gain kinetic energy. Next step you want to state that the hot air expands and becomes less dense. Make sure you say that it's the hot air. They're going to be very fussy with the mark schemes here. There'll be lots of ignore air or ignore air particles expand. You have to be very specific that the hot air expands and becomes less dense. The hot air rises and cools and becomes more dense and sinks. So we won't win any prizes for English here, but as long as you've got all the key points, you'll score all the marks. A convection current has been set up and the process repeats. Okay, questions like this now, which everyone seems to find really difficult. The di diagram shows stages in electricity generation at a nuclear power station. Describe the energy transfers that take place in this power station. So the hardest thing here is to work out where to begin and you want to start wherever the fuel is and that's inside the nuclear reactor. So remember, because it's a nuclear reactor, then that will be nuclear energy found within that fuel. And remember, when we're talking about nuclear power stations, we're talking about nuclear fission. And a neutron collides with the uranium nuclei. The nuclei splits into two daughter nuclei and three neutrons are released. And that will therefore be the kinetic energy of neutrons which gets converted to thermal energy in the water. That thermal energy in the water is used to produce steam and the steam gains kinetic energy because obviously those water particles move more quickly and so that kinetic energy in the steam is used to move the turbine so there's kinetic energy in the turbine then that energy is used to create kinetic energy in the generator and finally, the generator produces electrical energy. So we've summarized it now, now I'm going to write a full answer. So nuclear energy in uranium is converted to kinetic energy of the fission products is the nicest way of saying this. Kinetic energy, so I'm linking it all together, is converted to thermal energy of the water. The thermal energy of the water is converted to kinetic energy of the steam. It's such a boring question. The kinetic energy of the steam is transferred as kinetic energy to the turbines and then lastly kinetic energy of turbines is transferred to electrical energy of the generator. So effectively, we've linked together all parts of this power station and talked about what type of energy transfers have taken place. Can we quickly remind ourselves of variables now? It's so important that you know the difference between these. So again, use the song on YouTube if you can't remember, but the independent variable is the one that you change. The dependent variable is the one that you measure. And the control variable is the ones that you keep the same, so list at least three. 
So just to take this example, question six, a student uses this apparatus to investigate how the current in an LDR light dependent resistor varies with the intensity of light. So I'm going to ignore the first question, go straight to the variable. The table lists three types of variable. Complete the table by giving an example of each type of variable for this investigation. So a control variable. So what do we need to keep the same in this experiment? Well, the power rating of the lamp is crucial that we keep the same. Because obviously, if we alter how strong or how bright that lamp is, then it's going to screw up our experiment. The dependent variable, which I've already written, is what we're measuring. So what are we measuring here? Well, we're measuring the current of the LDR. And then lastly, the independent variable. Well, what are we changing? Well, it says here we're investigating how the current in an LDR varies with the intensity of light. So we're obviously altering the intensity of the light. Let's double check that we're happy drawing graphs here. So we've been given a results table here and below we're going to be asked to draw a graph. So how do you know what we draw on the x-axis and what we draw on the y-axis? So the x-axis is the thing which is easier to plot. And it's the thing that we change, which is therefore the independent variable. The y-axis, we're going to be plotting the average results. So the y-axis is the thing which is harder to plot because hopefully you can see, look, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, easy to plot. So it goes on the x-axis. The y-axis, look how much harder these points are going to be to plot. So harder to plot, it's the thing that we're measuring and therefore it's the dependent variable which goes on the y-axis. So based on that, this will be the distance from the lamp. We need units in centimetres. And then the current in MA will be on our y-axis. Pick good scales, so you want to occupy as much of that graph paper as possible. So I'm going to go up in tens along the x-axis. That fits really nicely. It's almost like they planned it. And then looking at the average mean, okay, so we have to go from 1 to 105, so that's going to be more difficult to plot. We're going to have to go up in 20s to make sure it fits the graph okay. So... 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, and now we're ready to plot. So 10 needs to go at 104.2, so that's around here. Right, I'm not going to plot the whole thing. This isn't what this video is about, but notice that it says draw a curve of best fit, so you're not drawing dot to dot, you need to draw that freehand. Okay, they often ask you to draw the forces acting on various objects. So on the diagram, draw and label the forces acting on the steel ball as it falls at terminal velocity. So what's acting downwards? Well, it's the weight of the ball and acting upwards will be drag. And notice that it's at terminal velocity, which means that these forces must be equal, which is why we have to draw equally length arrows, so potentially a bit longer. Don't miss these questions. Look, it's worth three marks, so make sure you answer the question and don't just skip on. Explain in terms of forces what is meant by terminal velocity. So I'm going to use this as an excuse to write a full answer for terminal velocity, not just the three marks, but a five marker. So you want to state, start by stating which direction the forces are acting in. So weight acts downwards, drag acts upwards. As the ball falls, struggle to say that. The drag increases. Eventually, and this is the important bit for answering this question, drag equals weight. There is no resultant force and no acceleration. If you like these sorts of answers, 
my revision guide is full of them. This is like the perfect answer you need for this question. So the ball travels at constant speed. So I've probably said about six marks worth of things here. Right, let's look now at this magnetism question, which they're always super popular, and I promise you can write the same answer every time. So the diagram shows a simple electrical generator connected to a lamp. When the coil is turned, a voltage is induced. Okay, look, it's told you that it's a generator. So make sure you read the question. Some people might be tempted into thinking that this is a motor because they've seen similar diagrams being described as motors. But the crucial thing here is that we have a lamp. If it had been a motor, then we would have seen a cell here because remember with a generator, we're trying to produce current. So explain why voltage is induced when the coil is turned. Now here, the answer is always the same, which is that the coil moves through the magnetic field at right angles. It's crucial that it's at right angles, otherwise you won't get a voltage induced. And how could we make this induced voltage larger? Well, move the magnet faster or increase the turns on the coil. People are always, especially people I teach, they're always so tempted to say increase the current here. But that makes no sense because you're trying to output current. You're not putting it in in the first place. So you can't get a stronger voltage out by putting more in because we're trying to create voltage by, by moving coils within a magnetic field. So make sure you're very clear that this is the generator and not the motor. Another question they often ask you is to describe the difference between transverse and longitudinal waves. This is effectively a question asking you to define both, no more than that, and obviously I'm not drawing a diagram. So start by saying that transverse waves vibrations, and this is the crucial word, occur perpendicular, or you could write at right angles, to the direction in which the wave is traveling. Whereas longitudinal waves, such as sound waves, Vibrations occur parallel to the direction in which the wave is traveling. So exactly the same template answers, just swap perpendicular for parallel. And then you don't have to learn as much. Right, drawing Sankey diagrams, again, something else which people aren't too keen on doing. So modern wind turbines operate with an efficiency of 30%. Draw a labelled Sankey diagram for a modern wind turbine. So remember, Sankey diagrams basically show efficiency as a diagram, which states that useful energy out divided by total energy in times by 100. So going into our Sankey diagram we need to have our total energy in. So total energy in, we haven't been given any specific answer numbers here, so that will be 100%. Now notice that it operates with an efficiency of only 30%, which means that the useful energy out will not be that wide, the arrow. So it'll look something like this. So it needs to be about a third of the width of that arrow coming in. So something like this will be absolutely fine. So 30% will be useful energy out, which means that a great proportion of that energy is wasted. It's up to you if you do it like at right angles or do it a bit more freehand like I'm doing it, but just try and make sure that your arrow's approximately the right width. Probably less wobbly than that as well. I don't know why I'm shaking so much. So this will be wasted energy. So make sure you have numbers on each arrowhead and that you label what they actually mean. Let's go through our perfect answer now as to how air inside a container exerts the pressure. You always want to write the same answer here. It doesn't matter if it's like squirty cream or hot air balloon, it's the same answer. So air particles have 
random motion and collide with the walls of the container for the third mark generating a force. And then lastly, always state an equation, pressure equals force divided by an area, and that's it, honestly, that's all you have to say. Let's touch now on nuclear fission because we have a nice diagram of it here. Remember, that's when a neutron is absorbed by, tends to be uranium, and you have to say the word nuclei here to get the mark, producing daughter nuclei, which are these smaller ones here, and three neutrons. So please be aware of the process. So the perfect definition of nuclear fission is it's the splitting of an atomic nuclei. If they ask a bit more, it will be along the lines of explain how this fission process can lead to a chain reaction. So we're just going to write what I've just labelled but in full sentences. So write a neutron is absorbed by the uranium nuclei which splits to form two daughter nuclei, three neutrons are released, which collide with other uranium nuclei. So this is a nice full answer. A chain reaction is set up. It's a nice full answer. And just remember for me that the control rods absorb neutrons and the moderator slows down neutrons to allow fission reactions to continue. Let's touch on a bit of maths now. So question 11, an underground train enters the station, the mass of the train and its passengers is 250,000 kilograms. The total kinetic energy is 18 megajoules. State the relationship between kinetic energy, mass and velocity. So it's so important that you've learned all your equations off by heart. So Ke equals half mv squared. Calculate the velocity of the train as it enters the station. So there's our mass. Here's our kinetic energy. And we need to convert that into joules by timesing by a million. So there we go. So Ke equals half mv squared. I always rewrite my equation. We know our energy is this huge number. We're doing half of the mass, which we've been told is 250,000 kilograms, times what we're looking for, which is v squared. So let's sort out the right-hand side first of all. So half of 250,000 is 125,000. To get v squared by itself, we want to divide by 125,000 on both sides. To get v squared equals 144, and then to get v by itself, you want to square root by both sides to get 12 meters per second. So be really careful with units. I had to convert my mj to j.